Well, guys, uh, hello. Um, first of all, I mean, I, I wonder, uh, it's, you, you, some of you are arriving late. It's probably because I, uh, the, the message I sent uh, failed to be delivered, right? You kind of did not know what, what link to click. Or was there another reason? And um, yeah, I would be happy if you turn on the cameras, guys. It seems that there are too few people with their cameras on. What's happening? Are we losing people? Yes, well, great. Here's one more, here's two more. Alina, Jeffrey, Ryan, Getika, who else is here? Jason, Colin, oh, you know, it would be nice to see more of you. Now let's uh, solve this problem together. Uh, I hope you already had a con consider this. So it's a question from, I think, your uh, textbook. So a mathematician likes to drink his tea with rum as follows. He fills up one full glass of tea and another identical glass with rum. He takes a sip of the tea, then pours the rum until the tea glass is full again. He then stirs the mixture th thoroughly and takes another sip. He pours in more rum and repeats the procedure until both glasses are empty. The question is what's the probability that the last drink he takes is only containing tea? And we can simulate this as follows. We can imagine uh, that this is the situation, guys. So we have, uh, we begin this experiment by having only molecules of tea in one glass. I just consider this having three molecules and only molecules of rum, only three. So then what happens? First sample, basically if T is the last to survive, it's the last one to be removed is either molecule one or two or three, agreed? And by symmetry, the probability is uh, three times the probability that molecule one is the very last removed. Are you with me, guys? Yes. So let's, uh, let's see how, how uh, likely are we to survive first sample. So first sample, notice I ignore the others. Survival of the first sample is what? Uh, type in the comments, what's the probability to survive first sampling procedure? Okay, one person wrote, what about the rest of you guys? To survive, is, it means that you are not one of those picked. It's each of them is equally likely to be sampled. The, the one, the, the, and then there are two thirds probability of surviving for sampling, do you agree? Because uh, uh, it, it, two out of the chances, two out of three, it will not be picked. Then after that first uh, round, a molecule replaces, and then what do we have here? We now have again, the next survival for second round, again, two thirds. For the next round, two thirds, you see what happens here, right? I, I will remove and replace a molecule, and we don't care uh, about the others, we just pay, pay attention to one being the last. And uh, altogether, there are five uh, uh, samples, you see? So here is what happens. It's three times uh, first survival, uh, second survival, third survival, and then eventually there is no repetition. Do you agree? Eventually there is no replacement. Eventually the probability is one half. So the probability of survival is two over three cubed. You agree? If you carry out this experiment, I don't want to spend too much time on it. Do you see what will happen if you have four molecules in each beaker? Four molecules, you would have more procedures, then for most of them it will be three-fourths survival rate for a single molecule. And then eventually when the replacement stops arriving, it will be uh, three-fourths times um, two-thirds times uh, one-half. And all of that you multiply by four because uh, we either have molecule one surviving or molecule two surviving last or three or four. Do you agree? So if you have four molecules in each beaker, the answer will be uh, three over four to the power of four. And if you have five molecules in each beaker, the answer is four over five to the power of five. Do you all see that guys? Or do I need to uh, show you? Write in the comment, show where you see, come on. <clears throat> yes. In general, it's N minus one over N to the power of uh, one over N 
which is what? Which you recognize this is the situation, which you recognize the limit is, well, it's e to the minus one. Correct. <laughs> of course, why, what else could it be, right? Jack, you don't seem happy about that result. All right. Here is another question. A jewelry display window was shattered in some trinket store on Madison Avenue and a shiny golden ring was stolen by one and only one of N suspects. Each of them is initially assumed to be guilty with probability one over N. Vasya Varonov is one of the suspects. An eyewitness testifies that uh, she saw the thief escaping in a black car. An innocent person is likely to drive a black car with probability P0. That is maybe a ratio of black cars to all cars in the city. Furthermore, assume that the eyewitness uh, testimony is reliable with probability P1, which is bigger than P0. Uh, then we have let A be the ratio of P0 over P1. You see why those ratios matter in a moment. And B the ratio of one minus P1 over one minus P0, okay? So <clears throat> P0 is that the person is just innocently going into a black car and uh, P1 is the uh, reliability of testimony. So A, if camera evidence shows that Vasya Varonov has driven away from the crime location, what is the probability that he is the perpetrator? Okay, let's calculate this A together. So here is uh, the situation, guys. So let G sub K be the event that suspect K is guilty for K one, two, all the way to N, where suspect N is Mr. Varonov, okay? So in this uh, problem, right, uh, we have that one of N suspects, we have arrested N suspects, and we know for sure that one of those suspects is guilty. Good? One of those suspects, suspect number N is Vasya Varonov, and it's known that he uh, went into a black car you know, because there is camera evidence that saw the suspect uh, drive away in a black car or something, right? And then let BK be the event that suspect K is driving a black car, you know, or being observed with that. So we are interested in the probability of G sub N that uh, the guilty person is person number N, given that uh, person number N drove in a black car, good? So that's very simple. Then we just take a update of evidence like we did uh, before. And so what do we get? We get uh, a probability, we just convert this probability, right? It's the probability of BN given GN times the probability of GN being guilty. And each of them is uh, without further evidence is equally likely to be guilty. You all understand this line, yes guys? I just, I, I just uh, take the intersection and divide by BN and then I condition uh, based on that, okay? So what do we get? We get uh, BN given GN, probability of GN. That's, uh, uh, that's the probability uh, of the evidence, of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the reliability of this observation. That, he was, that, that means that he was seen going into a black car given that he is guilty. <clears throat> this is um, P1 times one over N. On the bottom it's P1 times one over N plus P0 times uh, n minus one over n because probability is not guilty is n minus one over n, which when I uh, multiply and simplify, I just multiply everything by n, will get me uh, will get me uh, this expression one over one plus a times n minus one. It's just a simplification here. You see, I just uh, set a to be the ratio of p zero over p one. So I just simplify it and make it look like this. You can just kind of flip it like this if you want. Okay. Now here is part B of this question. Further investigation shows that Vasya is the only one from among N suspects who drove off in a black car. What is the probability that he is guilty? So that means that, look what it means. It means that the evidence matches to him and doesn't match to anybody else of the N suspects. Okay, you have to include that as well. Probably by the time I'm done with this question, you will just convict him, right? To be done with the trial. 
<clears throat> so what do we have here? That means that we are now interested in the probability that he is guilty given that nobody drove in a black car except for him. Do you see how I, I encoded it? Person one did not drive. Person two, all the way to person n minus one, except for him. And that's what we get. Good. And then of course we can use uh, multiplication rule. Do you see that multiplication rule is just, uh, this thing is P of G N, blah, blah, blah. And what do we get? Uh, probability that he's guilty without extra information is one over N. Now, each of those, the probability that uh, uh, B1 did not drive uh, did not drive a black car means that he is an, given that GN is, uh, is guilty, it means that he is an innocent person that does not drive a black car. And P0 is the probability that an innocent person drives a black car, which makes it one minus P0. This is one minus P0. This is the same thing as one minus P0 because you know they're not affected supposedly, right? So we have one over N, one minus P0 to the N minus one times uh, P1. P1 is the, is the probability of this evidence, right? The probability that in fact, person number N was observed doing that. Because even if you have a testimonial, maybe that's not uh, reliable. So I'm not sure how reliable is the witness. Maybe the witness uh, had some relations with that person and uh, now wants to take revenge. <clears throat> Good. So, that means what? That means that, uh, and now we can of course say that the probability, this is, this, is uh, th this probability, and now the probability of uh, B1 complement, B2 complement, all, all the way to Bn complement, it just, uh, uh, I just can condition it, look at it, you see what I do? I can condition it uh, based on who is guilty. I, I sum it up based on which person is guilty. You see, this is true and person one is guilty. This is true and person two is guilty and so on and so forth, okay? So um, as long as person N is guilty, uh, this is the situation. We already calculated it with person N is guilty. And the rest is the summation where somebody else is guilty, not person N. You of course follow everything I say, um, you know, without any trouble, correct guys? And that's why you're disappearing, right? Um, that's why I see more and more black boxes, right, Alina? Colin, Jason, Sabrina, Catherine. Oh, Alan, you disappeared. Hmm. You too, Alan. <laughs> Did you see my exam, by the way? Yes, you have seen the exam. And do you think I was, uh, it was an easy exam, yes? Look at it, my God. I mean, he could have asked us so many difficult questions and yet why hasn't he? Jack, you all right? Uh, Katie. Yes. Which, which exam are you talking about? The one that was emailed today. Uh, maybe two hours ago, maybe an hour and a half ago into your email. So that's the exam for our class. I think I said April 14th is the due date. Uh, make sure that you submit it precisely as I said, uh, including the way you title the file and that it's in PDF form and that it's one file. Okay, you can scan it. Uh, Thank you. Yes, uh, one file. Yes, guys? Make mm -hmm. it, when you're done, make it ready and uh, I will see if you submit it by Blackboard or by um, email, right? So it's uh, maybe by Blackboard, maybe by email, I'll see. maybe both just to be safe. Good. Um, Arcady. Yes. When you come up with a decision, can you email us and let us know how to turn it in? What do you mean? I did come, I mean, ah, of course, that I will mention how to turn it in. <laughs> uh, what's, what's important is you, you have the package prepared. Everything is good, right? It's ready to be shipped. You say not, I would have told you just message, just send it to, to my address, you know, uh, but then I think, uh, do I want to give my address, right? Right, I know. Right, if it's, <laughs> there are people that want to, um, you know, to, to, to do their reckoning with me. I have quite an interesting story among such people. I told you I was once in an accident, right? And uh, then the guy is very happy, he's asking me, I came late to the class. This guy is happy and he's saying, I actually work at the DMV, right? And then he says, oh, you look very familiar. Like, haven't I seen you in such and such high school? And it turns out that he was a fellow student, right? He might have sat in the back. I'm not sure I didn't recognize him. So he was even doubly happy. 
-hmm. and then uh, uh, apparently we even moved uh, uh, somehow independently and yet uh, through similar uh, places. Uh, so he ended up leaving he once had to do the give the exam later and he was uh, living across the block at the time yes so so many coincidences yes but uh, the final coincidence the a uh, voice part it's a russian word that maybe the, the, the fate uh, failed him is that um, well i had to give him an f right so there are many many people around me uh, that uh, live there and say hello right and i imagine they have a very sharp knife <clears throat> but aside from that yes and also admirers too many admirers that i have to prevent myself from being flooded with love letters and uh, you know flowers and candies so back to this problem yes so uh, what is that summation by symmetry by symmetry uh, the summation goes through n minus one terms. So it's n minus one times the probability of G one, blah, 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 right? Uh, so what we have then is, uh, this is, this is the, this is the um, probability. So this probability here, I can now calculate this box here, just uh, do multiplication. You know how to do this. Yes, yeah, so just uh, G one, B1 given G1, B1 complement given G1, B2 complement given G1, B1 complement, blah, blah, blah. And what do you get? This probability that he, that person one is guilty is of course one over N initially, right? And what about this one? Probability B1 complement uh, given G1, if he is guilty, uh, uh, the probability that uh, he was not driving the car is uh, one minus uh, P1 times everything else is just one minus P0 to the N minus two, P0. And so once you simplify it, voila, you have this very nice result. Yes, I'm not gonna go again through it. I think it's, uh, you can read it afterwards if you want to and think about it, right? Uh, so here is another, um, another example, maybe easier to follow, hopefully for you. <clears throat> so a kidney study is looking at how well two different treatments Treatment A and treatment B work on small and large kidney stones. Ah, yes, it's a specifically a study that will be very interesting to some person here, right? Uh, here is the success rate that was found. So this is uh, uh, K uh, equals small stones, K complement equals large stones. Treatment A and treatment B, okay? So here is what we have. For small stones, treatment A, it's 81 out of 87, so 93 success rate. Uh, and for large stones, it's uh, 192 out of 263, 73 uh, success rate. Yes. And the total is uh, 273 out of um, 350. So the total people uh, that were assigned to treatment A were 300 people. And uh, uh, the total is uh, 273 uh, were, uh, I suppose, significantly cured. Now treatment B, uh, we have uh, uh, 234 out of 270, so 87%. Uh, and uh, in, in, uh, uh, for large stones, 55 out of 80, 69%. And total is uh, 289 out of 350, 83%. So the question is, which of the two treatments is better? Which of those treatments is better? Make sense? 
the question, yes? We are trying to decide based on that, uh, which of the two treatments works better. Okay, Jennifer says treatment A. Let's see about uh, the rest of you guys. Rodna says treatment A is better. Okay, treatment A. The rain jack is always with me. All right, what else? So Fiona also says treatment A, or if you decide that uh, treatment A is better. Let's uh, see it together. So <clears throat> the probability that treatment A is successful based at least on this uh, study is 0 0.78 and treatment B is 0 0.83. So some people might think that uh, a treatment, uh, I'm not sure, not, not any, nobody here, that treatment A is inferior to treatment B. But let's, uh, let's see. So how effective is treatment A given uh, that uh, a person has small stones? That is 0 0.93. Here it is, right? And uh, if, on the other hand, how is treatment B uh, uh, treating against, uh, against such uh, small stones? Uh, 87, only 87% only treatment. 93 is better than, so against small stones, it's better, right? And against, and let's see against large stones, which is better. A is better against uh, large stones than B. You see, given that you have large stones, treatment A gives you 73%, whereas treatment B gives you 69%. So uh, for each part, no matter which particular stone you have, it seems that treatment A is better. Was it obvious to you? Because um, treatment B seems to be uh, overall more successful, right? 83% of the people were cured here than in treatment A, fewer people were cured. So nobody fell into it, into this trap. Maybe you took it from, or thought about it from before, or it, does it surprise any of you guys? Here treatment, a seems to be 
worse uh, total than treatment B, but only when you compare uh, across uh, each separate category, large stones or small stones that you have the situation. Well, that's the question, right? So which, which treatment is better? It seems that overall treatment B was more successful than treatment A, but for each separate category against large stones, treatment B seemed to have been less successful. And against small stones, treatment uh, was uh, uh, less uh, successful, right? Uh, <clears throat> right? You see that uh, seems to be less and less successful there right? out of uh, more and um, more, more uh, you know, the, the thing is, the, re the reason that this is happening, uh, I suppose, uh, well, okay, so, um, let's see. This situation, guys, is called Simpson's paradox. Yes, you're laughing, Jack. What what made you laugh? Something else? Yes, yes. I decided I bothered you already today enough with with my associations. But here, I just uh, I always use every opportunity to tell you about something that you should read or some nonsense about why I use the letter K, uh, right, and <laughs> all sorts of things like that. So I decided you had enough with my emails today, right? Uh, so that's right. So the idea is like this, guys. Think about it, right? Imagine that uh, you have two students. The overall score of one student is like three points out of 12. And the overall score of another student is uh, 12 out of 12. You see, you might think that 12 out of 12 indicates uh, it's a better student, but maybe one student was getting very easy questions and another student was getting tremendously difficult questions. You understand? So the overall reason for why uh, treatment A seemed to be less successful is that it was receiving maybe the harder kidney stones. Okay, it was receiving a lot of uh, hard problems to solve. And so it failed more frequently, even though it's a superior treatment. You understand the idea, guys? So the idea is by proportion, right? If you give, uh, uh, you see, you need to look at, uh, you need to, how do you check if a student is good or bad? You select a category of questions and then see how they fare against that category, right? But if the uh, categories are not in the same proportion, you cannot compare them easily. Make sense? Yes, so if I give uh, one student, if I give both students the same number of questions, but the proportion of questions for student B are, uh, most of them are very simple, he is going to fare better. Even though uh, he will not have been faring well against hard questions, you understand? So you need to compare based on categories. So treatment, assuming the statistics is kind of good enough or reliable and you know, and there are also other things, but uh, that, that uh, the evidence uh, points to treatment A being better. Yes? You understand it guys, maybe too well, right? Maybe better than me, correct? All right, so that's, uh, that's in symbols. Where is it? Uh, yeah, I explain about the students in symbols. It's okay, you can read it afterwards. This one is very interesting. Under ancient Jewish law, if a suspect on trial was found guilty by all judges unanimously, uh, then the suspect was acquitted. If everyone finds someone guilty, by the way, it's a very good uh, thing for today. Uh, you should, you know, nowadays, if everyone finds or everybody blames or points a finger at somebody uh, and saying this person is guilty, that means right away you need to acquit the person. Mistrial. Is it interesting? Hmm? Yeah, it's not gonna be followed here. Uh, here it's uh, still a, a different type of culture. So why is that, uh, is that a good idea? So let's try to understand, hopefully I can explain why guys. It seems like it's a rainy weather. And uh, you know, all, I, all I'm thinking is, uh, do you want to hear that question of from what, when, where? So there are N judges uh, that decide on a case. The suspect 
has a prior probability of P of being guilty. Let's say there is some probability P that the suspect is guilty and it's known to the gods maybe. Each judge votes whether to convict or acquit the suspect with probability S, a systemic error occurs. So maybe the defense is incompetent or something uh, happens that uh, it makes the trial uh, very bad. If a systemic error occurs, let's say that, that just to simplify the situation, all the judges unanimously vote to convict. You understand? If there is too much coverage in the media, if it's too no, uh, if if a situation is too known and people are biased or they are afraid that if they don't convict that they will be um, they would be receiving a lot of backlash. You see something like this. So um, so. If that, if that exists, if there is some probability, there is a systemic error. And if it happens, then all the judges unanimously vote to convict. Um, now let's say whether a systemic error occurs is independent. We are gonna learn independence later on uh, more precisely. So forgive me, I place it here. Of whether the suspect is guilty. Given that the system, uh, the systemic error doesn't occur, and that the, the suspect is guilty, each judge has probability C of voting, that's C to convict, of voting to convict independently, okay? Given uh, that a systemic error doesn't occur and that the suspect is not guilty, each judge has probability W of voting to convict, W for wrong conviction. And that's also independently. So what do we have here? So uh, the probability P of initial guilt is between zero and one. So is uh, the probability of systemic error between zero and one, right? We just assume that it, it has some probability of occurring, which symbolically we just compare whether it's more likely that the systemic error occurs or less likely. And uh, the probability of wrongful conviction is in case uh, there is no systemic error is between zero and one half, it's less than a half, which is, uh, um, one half is less than the correct probability of conviction, which is less than one, okay? Wrong conviction should be, uh, you understand? So, so in the case of no systemic error, there is either a wrong conviction or correct conviction. Now the wrong conviction is less than a half, a correct conviction is more than one half, given that the suspect is guilty. Now suppose that exactly K out of N judges vote to convict where K is less than N. You understand? So if already K judges voted, not all of them voted, it means that systemic error did not occur, at least in the phraseology of this problem. You understand? So we, we, we suspect that if everybody says the person is guilty, then perhaps uh, there is systemic error, at least in the setup of this problem. And uh, if, the, if that does not happen, at least according to this problem, that means a systemic error did not occur. Now, given this information, find the probability that the suspect is guilty. What is P? P is the probability of initial guilt. In other words, uh, you look at a person, you imagine that somewhere there is some known to the gods, there is the probability that uh, the person will be convicted. We're just gonna compare abstract uh, relations here. Good? So uh, let's try to uh, set the problem up. Do you want to try it or it's, is it too much guys? Too many letters, too much to do it in class, I think, right? It's a bit difficult. It's a good to, if you sit by yourself, take, a, take time and think about the problem and set the problem up. Yes, so we do it together or do you want to try separately before we do it together? Yes, I, so I figured. <laughs> I hope you're following a little bit, guys. Do you follow the idea, right? The, the interesting part here is, uh, is this. Yeah, of course it's hard. Uh, the interesting part here is that uh, it's very counterintuitive, right? Everybody, uh, all the judges uh, uh, vote to convict. Okay, great, the, pers the person can be released. Go, goodbye, right? That's pretty interesting. It's a very interesting system in that sense, right? And this is an attempt to explain why that ancient Jewish law uh, was, was put in effect. Uh, so you see, of course, of course, I'm, we're making a simplification. You understand? I mean, the, the point is that uh, this was noticed very heuristically and um, in some discussions without 
over being overly mathematical, uh, this was apparently implemented in uh, ancient Jewish law. Good. So you understand what uh, what I'm saying. So uh, so we are of course making it a bit more robotic by saying if there is a systemic error, then all the judges will convict. It is true in some situations. There are some situations where I think there is just no way that the person will not be convicted. No way. So there is no, no way for a fair trial. Regardless of whether the person is guilty or not, there is no way for fair trial because uh, you know conviction is already a priori. Right? Uh, and, and given uh, harsh sentences and everything like that. Good. So and let's try to do it together. So let CK be the event that exactly K of N judges vote to convict. And let J sub I event that judge I voted to convict. And B event of systemic bias. G event that suspect is guilty. Good. So then uh, this is the, uh, this is my, uh, my, my interest is what's the probability the suspect is guilty given that uh, K judges voted to convict. Where K could be one, two, three, four, you understand. I mean, there are N judges altogether, right? What happens uh, if it's in general K judges? So doing this uh, situation, right? Uh, well, the judges are voting independently. There is no systemic error. The judges are voting independently. And uh, we condition, you see, because we want guilt given, given K judges voted to convict, it's much easier to calculate K judges voted to convict given that the person is guilty. Do you agree? So then how do I break it up? Do you all see how to do that, the numerator? Um, that means uh, K judges convict and the person is guilty. So I break it apart as pro person is guilty and uh, times K judges vote to convict given the person is guilty. Let me maybe write one step here in case it bothers some of you. So it's this probability of GCK divided by probability CK. Yes, guys, do you see what I'm doing? This, and then I can condition the numerator. I can say this is probability of G times prob by just multiplication, probability CK given G. I hope you understand this uh, process, very important process which we spent some time to establish. Yeah, so you follow me, yes, guys? I mean, I'm hoping you understand. I'm not sure how clear I am. So we set it up like this. Now, uh, what's, what's the situation? So um, probability of CK given G, which of, the, uh, which of the K judges voted? So it's N choose K times the probability that judge one, judge two, all the way to judge K. There is symmetry. The judges are, let's say they're, they're identical twins. So we have a lot of symmetry. It's the addition of probabilities based on which particular K judges voted to convict and which remaining judges voted to acquit. Do you agree? So by symmetry, I can say it's the same as, the, as N choose K multiplied by the probability that judges one through judges K vote to convict and the remaining judges voted to acquit. You with me? Yes, I hope you're with me. Alan, you're with me, makes sense? You see that guys? And that's given that the person is guilty. So if it's person is guilty, there is only correct conviction and wrongful acquittal. So if they're voting independently, uh, the correct um, conviction, uh, con uh, con what do you call it? Correct uh, verdict is C to the power of K times wrongful acquittal one minus C to the N minus K. Why is there N, uh, uh, N choose K? Because uh, if you said that we have, let's say 10 judges and you say five judges vote to convict which of the five judges vote to convict? Is it judges one through five or judges two through six or any other combination of five that votes to convict? So N choose K represent uh, the summation over the probabilities of which particular judges uh, voted to, uh, to convict. Now, because the judges in this problem are simplified to be exactly identical, the probabilities are symmetrical, you see? Uh, so that means that we can just multiply by N choose K. 
I hope you see that, guys, yes? It's like a binomial thing here. Uh, so what does, do we have here is n choose k, c to the k, one minus c to the n minus k. And on the other hand, uh, the probability of ck given uh, that k people convict given the person is innocent is n choose k. And here is wrongful conviction. K judges voted wrongfully to convict and uh, uh, the remaining judges voted correctly not to convict. W is conviction given that the person is innocent. Good, so we have this. And so what do we get? We get that probability of G given CK is, uh, is uh, we, we have the N choose K, they disappear, they, cro they are crossed out. It's just P CK one minus C N minus K, it's this numerator, right? And uh, the P is the probability of initial guilt, here it is. And on the bottom, it's P, the same thing. One minus P and uh, this formula without N choose K because it's, it crosses out from numerator and denominator. You see that? So this is my formula for uh, guilty given that K judges voted to convict and they're not all, um, not all of them, right? Now let's see what happens if all the judges vote to convict. So I want to know what's the likelihood that the person is guilty if all the judges vote to convict. So this I break apart into uh, several, uh, several parts here. So first of all, uh, I want to, <clears throat> what's B, let me just remember, it's B event of uh, systemic bias. So here, if all of them vote to convict, there is another thing that I need to worry about. Was, was there a systemic bias, correct? Was there a systemic bias? So uh, I, I, I condition this uh, as follows, right? So PG given CN, it's, don't faint, please. <laughs> don't faint. Uh, so uh, the numerator is what? Numerator here is PGCN, which I can write as PG bias CN plus PG no bias CN. You agree? That's what I do in the numerator. I just uh, break it apart further. Instead of just having G and CN, I introduce the bias and no bias. And on the denominator, <clears throat> denominator is CN. I, I break it into all the possibilities. So uh, the denominator is CN. A person is guilty and there is bias. A person is guilty, there is no bias. A person is not guilty, there is bias. And a person is not guilty and there is no bias. There are four, pos four possibilities, do you agree? If, a per if, if all the judges vote to convict, there are four possibilities, right? Two, two, two of them are generated because of bias, no bias, and another two because guilty and not guilty. You follow? There are four of them, I hope you can see. Uh, no, CN is, the, is, is that, uh, yeah, yes, sorry. It's everyone voted guilty. Whether, whether it's guilty or not, we don't know, but uh, they all voted guilty. So you see the denominator can be broken into four parts. Guilty bias, guilty no bias, not guilty bias, not guilty, not bias. Easy, right? I hope you can see that. <clears throat> uh, so what do we have? So then let's calculate each of those segments. What's the probability of guilty? bias and everybody uh, votes to convict, okay? So that would probability of guilty, probability bias given guilty, and bias given guilty according to our setup is independent. There is bias whether a person is guilty and there is bias whether the person is not guilty. Reality is worse, you know, reality, maybe there is much more bias when the person is truly guilty, who knows? We're, we're assuming that uh, bias is just there, good? Yes, a good book to read regarding that is Albert Camus, The Stranger. So probability of bias given guilty, probability everybody votes guilty given guilty and bias, okay? So if there is bias, they, it doesn't matter that the person is guilty, if there is bias, they all vote for, to, to make the person guilty. So it's probability P times the probability of systemic bias, PS. Good. Now, what about the next one? Probability guilty, no bias, everybody votes guilty. That will be uh, uh, P times one minus S, that's probability of no bias. 
And if everybody votes guilty, he's already guilty, right? So that means that they're all correctly voted that the person is guilty. This is a C to the power of N. And uh, we calculate similarly the remaining two. Not guilty, bias, everybody votes guilty. That is uh, one minus P is the probability of no guilty. Uh, the probability of bias is S. And no matter if guilty or not, if there is bias, they always vote guilty. So it's one. And finally, uh, not guilty, no bias, and everybody uh, votes to convict. It means that uh, it's one minus P times one minus S. Everybody wrongfully voted to convict. And when I simplify this expression, uh, what do I get? I get guilty uh, given CN. If I just factor it out, is this expression. Just put everything I calculated is this expression, okay? Now, suppose we have n larger and larger. There are many judges. As n goes to infinity, what happens? A C is, is smaller than one. So this thing is crashed to zero. So that would be approximately S. And W is crashed to zero. So this is also approximately S. So you see, this is PS. Uh, and this is uh, S. And this is also S. So in the limit, look what happens. In the limit, uh, what you're getting is PS over PS plus one minus P over S, which is PS times uh, P plus one minus P times S, which is just P. In other words, uh, in other words, the judges haven't done anything. The probability that he's guilty has not been increased. You understand? There was an initial some, some suspicion the person is guilty, but the trial did not increase the sense that the person is guilty. That's the conclusion of this uh, process. Yes, you understand what happened, guys? In other words, uh, that something, something that is kind of truly happening in reality, I suppose, is that, uh, is that the trial is just an initial trial. You see, the, por the purpose of the trial is not to just uh, lead a person to execution or to prison, uh, to a prison sentence, correct? The purpose of the trial is to determine whether or not the person is guilty. It's actually a hearing to decide is the person truly guilty or not, correct? Not just to torture them. Otherwise it's called a show trial. So in this, this, this then indicates that the trial was a show trial because there was no increase in, uh, uh, in the likelihood the person is guilty. Clear? It's useful to think this way, right, guys? I mean, hopefully useful, because uh, I'm not sure if it really prevents you from, from your biases. Probably it doesn't. But I mean, it, there is a faint hope that it does. All right, uh, then you are tired. Let's play a game. Good. This is a bit easier to comprehend than those trial proceedings with those old wise Jewish men. So, so we have three cards, card one, card two, and card three. Okay, guys, the cards are not, they, they are colored, one card is colored black on both sides. Another card, the middle card, is colored black and red. And the last card is colored red and red. Okay, so what would you, is, is, there a, is there a preference? Let's say we play this game, guys. I'm going to take a card and I'm going to randomly take the card without looking, place it on the table. If I see that one side is, let's say black, I will bet both sides are black and you will bet that uh, this card is black red. Understood? If I see red, I will bet both sides are red red and you are going to bet, uh, uh, bet that it's a red black card, the middle card, you understand? So, uh, so who has the advantage in this game? Or maybe nobody has advantage in this game. Is it a fair game if, if that's how I decide to play it? What do you think? You understood my question, guys? Very simple game, three cards. I randomly pick a card without looking, place it on the table, um, randomly placed on the table. Then I, I look at it and I see, okay, well, the side I'm seeing is let's say black. 
then I will bet both sides are black. And you're gonna bet the other side is red. Does anyone have advantage in this game? Okay, Fnu says uh, one half. So then for Fnu, you say there is no advantage, no bias in my favor, yes? Because uh, you see, oh, you can say this way. So let's say if, the if one side is black, it means it's either uh, C2 or C1, correct? Either it's this card or it's that card, there are two possibilities. If one side is red, it's either this card or that card. There are always two possibilities. And so uh, the probability uh, that I win is the same as the probability that you win. Okay, am I right? Yes? So we can play this game. You agree with my logic guys or not? I'm not sure. So uh, Sarah says no, I mean, uh, somebody says yes, you're giving me mixed signals. I'm smiling always, fair or not fair. Well, we're all of us always wrong, yes guys? Think about it a little and then we will analyze it together. So you're just trying to decide based on my facial expression whether this game is good or not. I'm not a very, I'm not a card person, you know that guys. So guys, uh, come on, wake up. I know it's raining. I lost a few people somehow. There were three extra people and now they're only 30. So, okay, very quickly, do you play this game or not? Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't care what you think about your emotions. I'm just saying mathematically, do you play it or not? If you're saying you're not playing, I mean, uh, why are you not playing? Justify. Okay, so Aaron says two thirds in my favor. Uh, Colin says it's a fair game. Okay, the question is not about me, is the game is fair or not? And uh, do you have an intuition about it? I'll let you know in a moment. Okay, seems fair, Roadra says it seems fair. Okay. And what do you think, Anton? The upturned card, uh, well, the upturned card that I don't, I mean, uh, you see the way, the way we play it is this, depending on what side I see, I do not know which card I pick. It's either C1 or C2 or C3, either one, two or three. If, um, if I see both sides are black, sorry, if I see one side is black, I bet that both are black. And you will bet that it's a mixed card. Make sense? Okay, Jennifer thinks it's fair. Anton seems fair. 
Uh, Fiona already said it seems fair. Kira, Abo, do you think the game is fair? Sabrina, what do you think? Jack says not fair. Okay. All right, let's do it together, I guess. Yes? So intuition should tell you this, guys. If you see something happening, it makes it, uh, you see, if you see red, on one side, it, it's more likely to have uh, been observed given that both sides are red. If you see black, it's more likely to have been observed if both sides are black. You understand? When you see something, uh, you think right away what produced it is the most likely event that could have produced it. Okay, but let's uh, actually carry the calculation to see that. So let's suppose that, uh, just let's calculate it in this, it's obviously symmetric. Let's suppose that red came out, right? So when the card is on the table, the side you're observing is red, right? So what's the probability that the card is a third card is this card given that I am observing red. If black, I mean by symmetry, it will be obviously the same probability, good. So what is that going to be? So by conditioning, it's probability of observing red given card C3, probability that I pick card C3 divided by probability of observing red given card C3, probability of C3 plus probability of observing red given card C2 probability of card C2. I can, I can say I can condition on C1, but that's zero, right? I don't need to bother with it, good? So it's either this or that. Now let's try to observe which of those uh, are, are available for us, okay? So uh, clearly the probability of C3 and of C2 of picking those cards initially is the same. That is the probability of picking the card. So this is one third, one third and one third. I can cross them all out. And I get that this, this probability of observing red given C3, obviously it's one, right? C3 is on both sides red, so it's one. Uh, on the other hand, uh, red given C3, it's one and red given C2 is some probability P. In other words, uh, um, I'm not sure how the, the card is placed on the table. I agree. So it could be placed in a way that it presents. If it's the middle card, I can place it on the table in a way that I observe red or in a way that I observe black. So initially I, I assign this probability P of being uh, displaying red, okay? Maybe it's not equal probabilities. So truly the solution is one over one plus P, good? If P is equal to one half, in other words, if uh, we blindly pick the card and we're indifferent in how we place it, maybe this way or that way, understand that we pick the card and we are indifferent to how we place it, it's randomly done. And then a P is one half, it's equally likely to display this side as that side. If that probability is one half, which in most cases it would be, then the situation is uh, one over one plus one half. Multiplying by two, it gives you two thirds. So that means that if the car is picked out of the pile and placed randomly, then my winnings are two thirds as likely. Just because you have two options, that does not mean them, that, that they are equally likely. I am going to win two out of three times. Okay, of course, guys, if I uh, somehow have a way to place the card differently, uh, that can be uh, done, uh, that, that can produce a different probability. If I could somehow, or somebody else, you know, uh, feels which side to place if they pick this card, right? Then of course I can rig it and make the probability very different. Good. So that's why provisionally I placed P here. Depending on uh, randomly placing the card, if I randomly place it on the table, once I pick it, randomly choose one side or the other, the probability that I win is two thirds. Do you see that? Do you see that everyone who said that it's one half? So those that suspected that the game isn't fair were correct. It is not. And here I try to do it using a Kafka protocol, very, uh, you know, just different way of, of doing the same observation, trying to show you without conditional, uh, without the symbols, why the answer is two thirds. 
by labeling the sides of the card as uh, you know as red and, and black and doing that type of thing. Okay, I, I'm going to skip it. If you want to, you can read it again. Okay, so here is a prisoner dilemma. Yes. Out of three prisoners, one was chosen to be executed at random. Prisoner in cell number one asks the jailer to let him know one name from the list of the other two prisoners that will not be executed. Uh, would such information affect the probability that prison, uh, prisoner in cell one is executed? You understand what, what my question is, guys? Right, so you understand that, uh, that they, they are told, all those prisoners are told that one has been already, that one was selected to uh, be executed at random. So prisoner one wants to know which of the other two prisoners will be released. Because you understand uh, only one person is executed, the, the remaining two are released. So clearly, uh, regardless of the situation, there is at least one prisoner that can be released. The jailer does not want to reveal this information because the claim of the jailer is, well, if I let you know that information, then you, it's now between you and another person. Now you know, one is released, so now it's either you or another person. So now your probability of being executed is one half. So it's unfair. What do you think? You follow my question, guys, right? Uh, will revealing that information, which person let go, it, will, affect, will it affect the probability that person one is going to be executed? Think about it carefully. So Anton says, yes, it does affect it. Uh, Fnu says, uh, yes, revealing it is unfair. And think about what it even means, right? Uh, what it would mean to be, to, for the probability to be, to be affected by it. So Fnu says before the probability was one third, now the probability that the person will be executed is one half, is that correct? It's interesting, yes, guys? It challenges what you think about probability. I mean, do you think of probability correctly? Or at least, do you think about probability the way I do? Third one. <laughs> Well, those are uh, my alter egos that I can keep imprisoned. Well, of course I did. You like my drawings? Uh, so Sarah, yes, I, uh, I think in some sense like you do, right? I mean, decision was already made. I mean, what is this information? But, but think about this, uh, Sarah, right? Uh, this is still a bit, uh, a bit confusing. Imagine that the jailer told him exactly, uh, let's say somehow the jailer comes and tells you those, those two guys are not going to be executed. Now this guy knows that he is going to be executed. Now it's probability one, correct? Because uh, once this information is given, uh, he knows it's certainly that he is executed. So information might somehow still affect this uh, probability. It's very tricky, right? What is it that we mean when we say probability? What we mean is, I think initially you are in one of three universes, either in the universe where you are executed or the universe where person number two is executed or the universe in which person number three is executed. And those universes are equally likely. Some information might, might tell you in which universe you are located and there, thereby make it very definite. You see, why is it one out of three? You're in one of three equally likely universes, right? So the probability is, 
in my mind, it's really uh, like selecting one of the universes. And if probabilities are not equal, it's like one universe is doubled, let's say, for example, or tripled. Same universe looks exactly the same, but it's, there are many copies of it. You see? So I really tend to think of uh, just always speaking uh, the, uh, some universes out of the more general collection of universes when I calculate probability. And information might let you know in which universe you are located and therefore affect the probability in that sense, right? So the decision was already made, that's true. But uh, uh, in the probability, you might ask, uh, it's the probability of, uh, of, it's your awareness, it's a measure of, in this case, of your awareness of the universe in which you reside. Okay, but let's see. Uh, but could the guard say that prisoner is the one not being executed? No, the guard is not able to say that, right? So let's now look at the question together, guys. Or do you want to keep it for next class so that you have something to think about? Yes, uh, we, will, we will go over exam one question since uh, that's what you... Ah, uh, yes, next class is after break. True. Well, I, I'm glad you don't want to leave. But I have a what when work question for you guys. You know, I, I you know I have so many things to talk about. Yes, I, I, my Yamiko wants to think about it. Okay, guys, it's a very interesting question. It's interesting when you kind of boil, uh, you know, boil your brain a little bit about it. So I will let it uh, sing there, and maybe what do you say if you want to stay with me? Uh, let's go and address exam. Uh, one questions. I know Ellis uh, and somebody else asked me about exam one questions. All right, uh, let's do that. Good. Uh, yes, uh, a fall 2025 and nine, apparently five and nine. Let's do that. Yes, why not? Maybe an extra credit. So let's begin with five. Five we did, uh, we did, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very, five is a, in some sense such an annoying question. Uh, yeah, I, I think I might have, if you, don't, if you can do it really quickly, I'd be very good. I will try. So guys, five, I mean, I hopefully did not ask a question that, that annoying. It's just, uh, it's rather involved, right? I kind Maybe of- Maybe uh, last. Right, so, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, let me see. I will, I will do it. So 32 cards are randomly drawn from an ordinary deck of 52 cards and divided among, equally among uh, four players. What is the probability that exactly two players receive all eight, eight cards of the same suit? Okay, so the annoying part is which of the players. So uh, that means, uh, let's say, um, which two players, right? So first of all, it is uh, four, choose two uh, players, times the probability that uh, uh, player A and player B uh, receive uh, uh, all eight cards of the same suit, but player C did not and player D did not. Agreed? So uh, four choose two because I said exactly two players. Uh, well, I, uh, so ah, you were talking about the exam I just sent. Well, no, I mean, I don't have it available here. You think about it, we'll see. Um, Good. Everybody sees this uh, part. A, B, C complement, D complement. Yes. Now, uh, what what can I do here? Uh, this is the same as four choose two. What is this probability? It's the probability A, B intersected with C union D complement. Yes, which is what? Which is uh, the same as uh, four choose two probability 
of of uh, C union D uh, probability, sorry, of A probability of, uh, you see, it's A, B and this complement, it's probability A, B uh, minus the probability of a, B, C union D. Are we together? We understand how I uh, how I was able to do that. It's because if it's what in A B, but not in C union D. So it's, it's so what I can do is I can take probability of A B and subtract the probability of what's in A B and in C union D. Yes. And so uh, what is this part? So this is uh, four choose two. And here we have uh, probability A, B minus, and uh, uh, here it, it is, as you can see, it's a union and C union D is are not disjoint. So uh, it would be minus probability A, B, C minus the probability of A, B, D, and plus the probability of A, B, C, D. Good. So, uh, of course, uh, because you see by symmetry, by symmetry, A, B, C, and A, B, D, are symmetric, right? And by symmetry, I can just replace this by two times ABC. So I can say, I can remove this and by symmetry, I can just introduce a two here. So I have uh, this expression and now uh, it boils down to evaluating this expression. What's the probability that player A receives, uh, uh, receives eight cards of the same type and, and B receives cards of the same type. So probability of A, B, write it down guys. I mean, I'm just gonna solve for each chunk, okay? Probability that A, B is happening. That means uh, that uh, I have to take uh, each player is supposed to receive exactly eight cards. So uh, A and B receive uh, receive uh, uh, cards of the same uh, of the same type. So then, which cards is A receiving? So uh, there there are going to be uh, f uh, four um, possibilities for the type for the type of suit for player A, and uh, three possibilities for the type of suit for player. B, correct? Four times three, right? So in other words, four uh, mentioned which suit player A receives, three mentioned which suit player B receives. Uh, now, um, once they receive those uh, suits, I have now uh, 13 choose eight, the particular uh, denominations of the cards received by player A, then uh, 13 choose eight, the particular denominations for player B divided by, um, now they, they can select any two cards. So any two cards, meaning uh, there, there can be 52 cards, choose eight for one player, 52 minus eight, choose eight for the second player. And that's uh, uh, one probability, okay? Now uh, for ABC, it's the same thing, except you now have to speak about three people. And A, B, C, D, you now have to speak about four people. Do you want me to do one, one of them or do you understand the idea? You just kind of then take piece by piece and uh, add them. Can I, can I ask um, yeah. why you did four times three instead of four choose two? Uh, because the four choose two will only tell you which particular denominations uh, um, uh, are, were selected, which suits were selected, but not which guy gets which suit. Okay, so because if I say four choose two, two, I know let's say hearts and diamonds were picked, but who got the diamonds and who got the got the hearts, whatever it's called. Okay, or and um, 
And why isn't that necessary to differentiate the values? Uh, to differentiate uh, uh, which values? Ah, the values because uh, because if I know the suit and the values that player A received, uh, and I know the suit and the value that player B received, that's okay. The, the reason he this is for for this first number is the is the possibilities of suit for player one. And this is the possibility of suit for player two. This is uh, the particular values uh, corresponding to the suit picked in first box. Okay. You see, I, I did not bother drawing the boxes, but you, but I had boxes in my head. You understand? Yeah, yeah, it's like four choose one times three choose right. one. If you visit uh, my brother's room, you understand how that uh, there are boxes everywhere, pretty much, right? So, yes, that's how you think. You think in boxes. You understand? You navigate through the boxes. Understood? And this is this probability. Do I need to uh, do this or that, or you understand how to obtain it? And I uh, can ignore the other, you see, by, by restricting my sample space, I can ignore the other players. You understand? I mean, I'm using some sort of uh, reduction to make the calculation. I could include them, but that's not going to affect the probability. You understand? I mean, I'm able to change my sample spaces uh, when I do the ratios. I can ignore information or don't calculate the information that's not going to affect the probability. Make sense? I can I can vary sample spaces that that gives me the benefit of um, it gives me a lot of benefit. I don't always have to com consider the full situation. Good, uh, we're done with this question. Yes, guys. Thank you. Yes, uh, you, you just think about how to do this, and that, that's a bit annoying uh, to calculate. But uh, you know, it, the reason I asked, I thought. I thought, well, it uses both letter symbols and uh, inclusion exclusion, and um, you know, right, and all sorts of ideas all together. It's varying through sample spaces, so it's like a question that you can ask, and, it, and if people know it, then they know it. What else can I uh, do? What else do I have to do? Um, I think Fnu wanted. He, he had a clarifying question about the spring twenty twenty one exam. Oh, okay, Fnu, not... what uh, what do you want to know about that exam? Is he is he still here? Fnu, are you there? If not, I had asked for number nine. One oh, second, let's see. Yeah, well, Fnu, what would you like? You have a question? Let me know what's the question. Yes, and the, what was question number three, remind me? Yes, and what about it? Okay, a traveling circus is moving in a train consisting of 20 cars, which were randomly uh, adjoined to each other. Two cars are carrying clowns, two cars house trapeze artists, four are reserved for lions, four for bears, four for elephants, and four for tents and provisions. What is the probability that no elephant or bear car precedes the first car with lions? Yes. Uh, well, 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 imagine that you're seeing a train, right? Have you seen trains? They're coming to the station. And you see first uh, the, uh, the engine of the train, and then you see uh, next wagon, then after that another car, and another car, and another car. So my question is this. What's the probability that uh, uh, when you first see the first cart that carries lions, that before that cart you have never seen elephants or bears? You understand that they that all the elephants and bears. I'm not claiming that all the lines are together. So maybe there, there are four line cards. So here's one line card, and maybe it will be followed by a bear card, or who knows by what. But uh, you will first see a line card, after which you will see the uh, remaining cards involving bears and, and uh, elephants and something else. Make sense? You understand, guys? Yes. Well, wonderful. What, so now question nine. Thank you. Okay. Oh, God damn it, this one, right? Two deck uh, of 52 cards are randomly shuffled together to form a deck of 104 cards. What is the probability that no two copies of the same card are next to each other? So, um, Yes, so let's see. 
So what is what does it mean? Uh, we have 104 cards. Do you agree, guys? 104 cards altogether, but some of them are from deck A, some of them are from deck B. So uh, let's let, let's suppose that uh, we have those events. So let's say a CK event cards uh, type K together. You agree? So, so you understand that if there are 52 cards, I can imagine the cards as listed one, two, three, 52. And uh, that's from first deck. And from second deck, they're also listed one, two, three, 52. That's how I, I cause them to be mixed. So CK means that a card of type K, maybe, maybe C3 will mean that the, three, uh, the card number three is next to three. Make sense? So what am I interested in is in the probability that uh, C1 is not true and, uh, and C2 is not true. And C3 is not true and all the way to C52 not. You agree? Because the probability is that neither card one is in card ones are not neighbors, uh, twos are not neighbors, three are not neighbors, and onwards. Good. So that is the same as one minus the probability that either C one or C two or C sub fifty two. Yes. Now, what is this? This we can solve by inclusion exclusion. You agree? So this is one minus uh, summation. And do you remember this thing I said R equal to uh, one all the way to 52 in this case of minus one to the power of R plus one. And uh, here we have I one less than I two less than I R probability C, uh, CI1, CI2, CIR. Now the summation can be replaced. You agree the summation that there is symmetry here. The, any, any R cards are equally likely to be next to each other. So I can write this as one minus um, R equal one to 52 minus one to R plus one. And this summation can be replaced by 52 choose R, probability C1, C2, CR. You agree? So I simplify, I remove one of the sums, it's 52 choose R. So then I have to figure out how to calculate C1, C2, CR. So that means that uh, R cards are the same. Our cards are the same. Now, what is that probability? Think about it, guys. How can they be the same? So first of all, if they're the same, it's either a card from deck one is in front and from deck two is behind or vice versa, right? So for each of those cards, there are just, uh, it's two to the power of R possibilities of which is in front and which is behind. Do you understand how I get to the R? Uh, first card, is it, do I first see, let's say from left to right, do I see from deck one or from deck two first, right? Make sense, guys? Is it like this or is it like this? Like if you see the piles, is, is, is the first deck uh, on top or second deck on top? So uh, for R possibilities, there are two, 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 two to the R possibilities. Uh, and then once in, the, in, in card ones are together. So one and one is together, two and two are together, three and three, all the way to R and R. They're together. So how many total objects can we move around? Uh, we have uh, uh, 104 total objects initially, but, uh, but the R objects are glued, right? So th this is double objects. In other words, one and one are, are one object, two and two are one object, three and three are one object. You agree? So once I move them around, I have uh, 104 minus R objects that I can move around. The, why, why just minus R? Because uh, we have 104 minus two R cards that can do whatever they like. And uh, two R cards that are uh, attached by pairs, right? So two R attached by pairs, meaning that uh, the two R used to, we have two R cards, but because you glue two of them at a time, you just have R cards. So uh, we have 
104 minus 2r plus r, which gives us 104 minus r. Do you understand that, guys? Or do I need to re-explain it? So it's 104 minus r factorial divided by 104 factorial. And that's this probability. So it's just this summation, I, I, it's very ugly, right? It's this summation where this uh, P of C1, C2, CR is replaced by what I wrote on the top, replaced by this. So, so was the two to the R originally like the denominator under the 104 factorial and then it gets moved up to the top? Uh, uh, so let me, let me just uh, uh, write it here. So this is the situation, right? So, uh, Let's say we just, we, we make it few, fewer cards, right? Make, let's make it uh, uh, 10 cards, right? So one, two, three, four, all the way to 10, okay? So, and then we have here one, two, three, four, all the way to 10, right? Let's suppose that uh, we are going to glue together one, two, and three, right? One, two, and three, so they're now one object. So first, why do I, what is it two to the power of three? Because either this is on top or this is on top. So that's two possibilities. Either this or that is on top, two possibilities. This or that on top, two possibilities. You can put it in Kafka protocol, in a document, you understand? I just imagine the document, I don't always write it, but I always imagine it. And I'll make sure on the exam that you indicate to write that the protocol, because that will help me also see what you're doing. So, um, this means uh, we card one in, in pile two or pile one is on top, right? So this is, this is the first part here. Second part is uh, we now, the, the, whatever is in bubble is now one object, right? How many objects do we have? We have, uh, we have 20 objects altogether initially. It's 10 plus 10, 20 objects altogether minus, uh, uh, minus those bubbles. Those are the individual objects minus uh, two times three, yes? Uh, those are the single card objects. And then we have uh, two times three, which are the double card objects. But two times three, really there are three double card objects, you see? I mean, so the two is gone here. It's really double card object. So it's really 20 minus two times three and three objects. So together we have 20 minus two times three plus three. So together we have 20 minus three objects that we can move around. Does it make sense? So this was the double objects. There are, th there are three double objects, three double objects or R double objects in general and uh, uh, 20 minus two R single objects. Double objects, the two cards attached, clear? So then uh, when that happens, I can place those cards in any order. I just have now two to the power of uh, three in this case and then 20 minus three factorial divided by 20 factorial, if I can move them individually. Good. Makes sense, uh, uh, boxes, uh, Ellis? Yeah, thank you, yeah, it does. Okay, Maybe, hopefully it does. Um, okay, what else? So what else do I have to go over? There are two, there are two questions. Wait, one second. So no, a certain non-standard deck of 60 cards, there are 10 distinct denominations. Uh, yes, and, and, and what, what about it? So uh, in this question, it means that uh, one player receives, uh, uh, receives two pairs and another person receive a, receives a triple, but the denominations of the pair and the triple, basically the, the, the denominations on the car of player one and the cards of player two are different. They are no match, you understand? So uh, they're completely different cards, not of, this, not of the same denominations at all. But one person one has a pair, person two has a triple. Make sense? Well, good. Um, let's see what else we have here. So uh, Jennifer, you are asking for question 11, correct? From uh, this exam. Yes, yeah, so this question, I think uh, uh, some, somebody from programming bothered me about it, but I think I actually made an error. I can tell you what I was, uh, I, I have asymptotic uh, uh, calculation for it, but not uh, the, uh, the, 
you know, the absolute calculation of it. So you see a letter cannot be moved uh, too far, right? So basically initially, um, So the letter can be moved k from its original uh, place, right? So what 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 I thought was okay. So uh, first, the letter has uh, uh, has initial possibility. It has k plus one uh, uh, possibilities, k plus one possibilities of where one goes in which box one goes, and uh, and uh, in the second letter it would it would overlap with the previous uh, interval, so it would be again uh, k plus one. And uh, then I think uh, I said it's k plus one uh, to the power of until you you cannot uh, you, you basically every time you move from one cell to the next you gain a box and you lose a box by something that was uh, what was filled in uh, by the prior number. But uh, but if you do this way, I notice there would be a gap. Okay, so uh, so the question is actually actually very hard. So let's uh, skip this question and uh, see if you just ignore this particular question. Uh, in my calculation, I made a mistake and I'm not sure if you can solve it uh, with something reasonable. Um, you can create an asymptotic behavior. In other words, they, it was asked by some student that was studying algorithms to uh, gauge the efficiency of an algorithm. For an algorithm, uh, my calculation is good enough because uh, the, the estimate that I have is correct. Uh, in other words, if you have many, many, if n is very large, uh, then my estimate would have been good. You know, for the asymptotic behavior, it's, it's good, but not uh, for the absolute behavior. So I think actually, uh, I, you know, I don't have a, a, a value for the exact um, number of uh, ways of doing that. I made a mistake, understood? So because I made a mistake, you can try, but you can ignore it. I can, you understand my idea, which is which, which you can see is, is that um, you, uh, once you select number one can move into any of K plus one spaces. Now the space is occupied. How, uh, now you look at number two. Number two opens a space behind and uh, a space forward, right? So, but, but one of the spaces is occupied. So again, it's K plus one. And then again, it's K plus one until the spaces are exhausted. And that will give you asymptotic behavior. The problem is that you might accidentally not play some number and there'll be gaps. So uh, what I said is not exactly right. Make sense? So other questions? I have one from the spring 2021. Just a clarification question with yes. the Macbeth and Banquo. Yes. So Banquo, you're saying that the the, the dining hall, it's just one of the 100 rooms, yeah, right? Yeah, of course. I, I knew it would be asked naturally. Otherwise, if he, if he completely avoids the dining hall and doesn't sleep there, then he will never see the ghost. OK, but it's one of the 100 rooms then. Yes, 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 absolutely. Okay. That's, I just wanted to make sure. Thanks. Yes, I knew it would be asked. Uh, I knew it would be asked for sure. <laughs> okay. Of course. <laughs> it's one of those rooms, yes. I thought too, I should add that it's one of the rooms, but I thought, well, a, a dining hall is a room, I presume. Yeah, it's yes, just it is one of 150 rooms. So yes, okay. correct. There are 150 rooms, including uh, the dining hall. It's one of the rooms. Good. Okay, other questions? Did you look at the exam guys? Uh, do you think it's hard exam or not very? Uh, or you don't know yet? I, I, I tried to solve it, it looks okay to me, but I also, I also wrote it, so who knows? Katie. Yes. Can I ask you a question? I know I should have asked you in the beginning of the semester. Um, to clarify, what is uh, Kafka's uh, protocol and like explain like how to use it and when to use it? Uh, well, Kafka protocol is just a way to document uh, uh, the results. So uh, if something is happening, can you document what's happening? So uh, for instance, for instance, um, 
let's say let's say let me give you maybe a simple uh, a simple question here mm. so suppose that suppose that we have uh, an urn and it contains um, it contains uh, balls one two all the way to ball number uh, 20 okay and ball number 20 is special it's a golden ball if you if you draw ball number 20 then you win okay i'm just giving the simplest uh, possible example of, of those what i call kafka protocol uh, and let's say that what you're what you are allowed to withdraw three balls good uh what is the probability uh, that you win okay so this is a question. So what I mean by Kafka protocol is uh, you have to very carefully think about what you're doing. How do you perform this experiment? So you are withdrawing three balls. Do you want to withdraw them one after another or do you want to take all three balls at the same time? That's the first decision you make, right? So let's say you withdraw the balls one after another, agreed? So uh, if you so so then the, the protocol is is documenting it's notarizing or the balls that you removed, okay? So solution A it's called sequentially. So then how would I document uh, this uh, process? What what has actually happened sequentially? So then there is uh, uh, three balls. This is uh, first withdrawal, second withdrawal third withdrawal. You see, that's the, my, that's the part of the protocol that I write. It's, it's the protocol. If you withdraw it, then you document what you took out. And that helps you, uh, that helps you count uh, the, the possibilities. So how many possibilities are there for the first ball that to withdraw? There are 20 balls. How many possibilities for this one? One out of 20? No, you're, you're giving me probability. I'm saying how many possibilities? When you document is, is, is don't go right away to probability, look at, you will withdraw three balls. Yes? Mm -hmm. So uh, once the game is over, it will be recorded on this piece of paper, that's the protocol. It will be recorded what happened. So how many possibilities are there for a value in the first, uh, in the first uh, box, you see? Because that's your first withdrawal. So there are 20 possibilities because what you would write here is either ball one or two or three or four or five or all the way to 20. There are 20 possibilities in this box. Do you agree? Once this possibility is recorded, uh, there are 19 available withdrawals. What's the second ball you withdraw? You don't know what it would be, but there are not, this is not the, the number of the ball. This is the possibilities. You understand? So maybe oh, okay. the answer, maybe this those document, you're just counting how many documents will be available. When you calculate probabilities, you select a universe. You select a universe out of many possible universes. So in this case, the universes are the sequence of balls that you took out. Make sense? So, so the key word is possibilities, not probabilities. Exactly. The key word is possibilities. Right? So that's for the, uh, for the entire experiment, right? So this is 20, 19, and uh, 18. Okay? So for instance, maybe what actually happened is that you First, we drew ball number 19, then ball number three, and then uh, ball number 10. Maybe that's what really happened, right? Or something else. So doing the document gives you a very clear way of uh, figuring the number of possibilities. So it will be 20 multiplied by 19 multiplied by 18. That's your sample space. That's how many universes are available. That's how many uh, pieces of paper. If you typed all the possibilities, there will be 20 times 19 times 18 possibilities. Okay, and you use the Kafka protocol for like permutation, right? For anything uh, where, uh, where, I, where I document what happened. It's, uh, it's okay. called documenting what actually happened, what actually took place. 
Okay. Makes sense. So I need to, if I know what I actually took place and I think about it carefully, I'm capable of solving probability questions. Now, uh, what is my uh, success? This is, this, is, this is all universes. Mm -hmm. Now, if I actually withdrew successfully uh, the 20th ball, I mean, I want to know what the probability of extracting the successful balls. I want to know in how many universes is the 20th ball coming out. So how do I do that? I can imagine using the same form for the success for the numerator with the exception that one of those values, either this value is 20 or this value is 20 or this value is 20, right? So really 20 is, is either in here, let's say 20 is in here or in here or in here. So it will be three times, uh, uh, times two possibilities and that would be 19 times uh, 18. So the answer is three times 19, 18 uh, divided by uh, 20, 19, 18. And that's the, that's the document. It allows, it allows you now to see that the probability is three out of 20. Okay. All right. And the, notice that the fact that I canceled it, it means that I could have created a different, there are many, many protocols I could have created for different counting procedures. And, uh, and uh, if you can create, you see guys, uh, even for this simple question, do you see that I canceled 19, 18, uh, and uh, I am left with uh, three times 20? It means that somehow that was not the most important part. Okay, somehow it was not the most important uh, part here. And so you could have solved this question uh, with a different protocol altogether, which would have been much simpler. Maybe I imagine a pest dispenser that I would remove them like this. So here are the three places that will be removed and here are the things that will not be removed. And ball number 20 can be somewhere in this pest dispenser. So it could be here, here or here. Uh, so there are three possibilities for, where that, uh, for, for which I remove the ball number 20 out of total 20 possibilities. So if I create a Kafka protocol that is very, uh, and th that's not my Kafka protocol, that's just the dispenser. The Kafka protocol would in that case be where is ball number 20, okay? So in, the, in here I have 20, uh, 20 places that I can have. And success means that I have to select either one or two or three. So that's three out of 20. The point is that there is not one protocol, there, are, there could be many depending on how you perform the experiment and they produce the same probability. Okay. Uh, but, where but, did, but, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, where, this, where did this uh, protocol originate from? From my head. <laughs> it is, uh, it is uh, uh, the best way that I have found so far to prevent uh, making mistakes and thinking uh, logically about those questions. Oh, okay. So uh, you can read Kafka and understand maybe why I decided to call it Kafka protocol because it relates to bureaucracy, right? So okay. Kafka is all about bureaucracy, about how to get to the castle. You need to file papers. You need to notarize them. You have arbitrary rules and probability feels like that as well. And so if you notarize, if you create documents, uh, then it will prevent errors. If you can create good documents, efficient ones, then it prevents errors. Okay. You understand it, guys? Yeah, thank you. Yes, you are, of course, all of you are convinced with, uh, of the great power of the Kafka protocol, correct guys? I, could, I kept making a lot of mistakes until I decided to do it this way, right? And if you, and if you worked in any bureaucratic department, you know about it. Uh, Ellis, does it mean 18 fair dice are rolled simultaneously? What is the probability of getting, uh, one second, there was something from before, right? Uh, Oh my God, yes. um, A coin comes up heads uh, with a known probability. Uh, in order to ensure fair outcomes, it is suggested to toss the coin twice. If the outcome is head head or tail tail, ignore and toss again. If the outcome is tail head, interpret uh, that the result is heads. If the outcome is head tail, interpret as tails. And I want you to show that, uh, that that makes the probability, it corrects for, uh, it makes the probability fair. It makes it equally likely to be heads or tails as the result. You understand how you can simulate an unfair coin, guys? Imagine you take a Wheel of Fortune and you select, uh, let's say the Wheel of Fortune is divided into 36 parts and uh, one part you label as a head and the other uh, 35 parts you label as tail. So you understand what we have here is a sort of unfair coin. 
and uh, out of this simulation, we want to create uh, we want to create a simulation that will uh, make it again fair. It's almost trivial, actually. Think about it, because if you have tail and head, head and tail, they kind of uh, they, those probabilities they balance each other out, because there is no preference if you do it uh, uh, new between head, tail, and tail head. Make sense? And uh, there was, uh, was there something else that I didn't address? Uh, yes, uh, something about 18 fair dice. Uh, so. Yeah, like the last post, that's how you phrase it in the exam. And I just want to confirm that you mean like my, how I rewrote it. I just want to make sure that I understand it. Okay, 18 fair dice are rolled simultaneously. Uh, well, yes, yeah, so what is rolled simultaneously? You take uh, 18 dice, you throw them. Uh, it doesn't, by the way, matter simultaneously or consecutively, right? Uh, you, can, you can verify that some of those things do not affect the result. So take all the dice, throw them, and uh, imagine that you have three that, that gave you one, three that gave you two, three that gave you four. I mean, you know, right? Uh, three that gave you three, three that gave you four, five, six. Each, each number came exactly three times. Thank you. Just check. Yeah. So if no, that is one possibility. One, one, right? Uh, you see, you just have to think about what it means. So you have 18 dice, you throw them and you observe the situation. They are each fair. You can also do it consecutively. You just take one die and then throw it consecutively and note uh, what, what sequence you produce. It's going to be the same. Good. Uh, six, six, five, five. Of course, uh, in, uh, of course, it's also a possibility. If you no, know, right? You just have to then think deeper. What are the what are the dice, right? Uh, how do you distinguish between them, right? Uh, when you when you do those problems, right? It doesn't have to because what is that consecutive thing? Is if you say one, 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 uh, what do you mean by that consecutivity, right? Uh, do you mean uh, that the dice are, they have some sort of serial number? We're just saying that uh, three dice uh, display the number one, three dice display the number two, three dice display the number three and whatnot. Yes, good. If you have, uh, make sure, that's why guys, if with us, it's very easy to miscommunicate anything. Make sure that however you solve this question, you indicate precisely what you're counting. So if you do the Kafka protocol, that should uh, indicate precision of your thoughts. That you are clear what you're counting, how you're counting it. You see, I always imagine a document and when I'm counting, I'm, I'm counting the possibilities of filling out that document. Good, which is, yeah, okay. Good. Good, other questions? I'm stopping the recording, yes guys, no other questions?